أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه أجمعين uh, Dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, the first remark I have is uh, this is an effort at its beginning and um, there's always in uh, an initial stage of any effort the rough areas that have to be worked out and therefore uh, instead of beginning at 1.30 as we should have begun we are beginning now and that has to do with uh, working these rough things out. Anyways, now we're together, I hope, uh, and we will uh, continue our journey in trying to work on the issues that, that have to be worked upon. Last week, uh, and I, I may have mentioned this last week, we hope to be understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in real time. And um, doing so is a comfort and is a source of fulfillment and satisfaction. Uh, there are many ideas out there and uh, a person is almost feels sometimes like he is in a jungle of ideas. And Allah's shining light guides us through the ups and downs and the lefts and the rights and all of these swiveling and swerving and zigzagging uh, analyses and commentaries about the affairs of our real world. Uh, last week, because and last week and the week before and the month before and this week and probably the week after and the month after, we're going to be living still with the issue of uh, racism and prejudice and discrimination and uh, segregation and superiority and inferiority and all of these notions that uh, have been troubling our psychologies and our societies. Some people think they are free of uh, prejudice and bad feelings or ill feelings towards others. Some people think like that because they haven't experienced uh, the dynamics of everyday life uh, in a non-sheltered way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I mentioned this last week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to our attention, gave us the necessary information to understand where the source of this discriminatory, prejudicial behavior uh, comes from. And that is shaitan himself. Shaitan uh, had a rationale for his disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It wasn't like he was disobeying Allah as a matter of ignorance. He was disobeying Allah as a matter of intellectual sophistry. And so when he was asked to pay respect to someone he considered to be inferior to him, he said, no, I'm not going to pay respect to someone who is inferior to me. This is the basis of all of this, whether you call it racism or nationalism or sectarianism or whatever other discriminatory ism there is. And there's plenty of them out there. They're all over the world and no race or nationality or religious persuasion or anything is free of them. They all have them. They're more concentrated in some than in the others, I grant you that, but it exists across the board. 
So in practical life, uh, this individualistic discrimination takes on a pluralistic representation. And that is called al-asabiyya. And we will see how this plays out in real life historically. And by understanding history, we can understand our current times. Uh, and so we will begin with uh, Surah Yusuf. This is the comfort of being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this short presentation every week, consider it to be uh, an opportunity to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and therefore to uh, feel peaceful about the information and the uh, vital, uh, relevant uh, issues that you and I are subject to in our daily lives. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to try to begin a uh, uh, a journey through Surah Yusuf to get a better understanding of the asabiya that all of us suffer from. And I'm not trying to be personal here. <laughs> I'm not accusing anyone of Asabi or anything like that. We're just looking at a social reality and a social trend that we hope we can identify accurately and therefore defeat uh, peacefully. Bismillah um, rahman rahim The surah begins, the name of Allah the mercy giving, the extremely merciful. Alif, Lam, Ra. There are many surahs in the Quran that begin with letters. This particular surah begins with three letters, the Alif, the Lam, and the Ra, which in the Latin version would be A, L, and R. Uh, this is supposed to be an eye-opener and a brain stimulator to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has composed this whole Qur'an, which is in the area of 6,000 and 600 and some ayat verses, out of these 29 letters of the Arabic alphabet. And if a person is familiar with the composition, the informational composition, the literary composition, uh, the uh, future uh, disclosures, that, and many other sorts of information that are contained in the Qur'an, and all of this is brought to us just by 29 letters. It's like thinking of the human race, every person in this world has a face. This is a limited area that we all have. No one has something gigantic and no one has something minuscule. It's all this general area that you see. And how many features does this general, small, very small area that is our face, how many features do you see on, in this small area? You see one person and another person and a third and a million and a billion and you keep on going and not any two are the same. So this becomes in and of itself a miracle. How can we have all of these different identities in this little small area? And this, likewise, how can we have all of these meanings 
in just these 29 letters of the alphabet. Alif, Lam, Ra. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin These compose the verses of the most clear of scripture. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. Before we go to this ayah, I want to say that the, the miracle, let's use the word miracle, uh, of the Qur'an is an everlasting one unlike the miracles of previous prophets. The miracles of previous prophets were temporary ones. Uh, Isa alayhi salam, he brought back to life a dead person, or he relieved a chronic uh, skin issue, disease that another person had. Or in the time of Musa, there was the Nile River changing into blood. Uh, there, were lo there were the locusts that invaded. There was Musa's, sta Musa's staff that began to act like a snake. There was the opening up of the sea. All of these were temporary miracles. The Qur'an itself is not temporary. It's ongoing and it's eternal in its miraculous content. And then Allah says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyya. Allah has made this Qur'an accessible in the Arabic, in Arabic. The Qur'an is Arabic. The first thing, when I say something like this, the first thing that some people entertain in, this, in their inner selves of selves is that notion of either nationalism or something that has to do with the ignorance of language, or with any type of feeling that would give some people either a feeling of superiority because they are Arabs, or a feeling of inferiority because they are not Arabs. Just by reading this ayah, this is a Qur'anic ayah, it is from Allah Jalla wa'ala, and it says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyya. Do you think Allah Azza wa Jal meant for us to feel something discriminatory because he mentioned this Qur'an is being revealed in the Arabic language? If we do feel something like that, we have a trace of this initial, primordial, iblisi, satanic expression in which he refused to pay respect to Adam. If you feel something like that, when this ayah, whether you're an Arab or a non-Arab, if you're an Arab, if you feel something superior about you because you know the, the language, you have that shaitani, that iblisi character inside of you. I don't know how much of it you may have, but even if it's a trace, if you feel a superiority, something is wrong. If you're a non-Arab and you feel an inferiority, then something is wrong with you also. The same way, it works both ways. This was not meant to have anyone feel prejudicial towards another. 
it if if any feeling should be there when you read this ayah inna anzalnahu qur'anan arabiyya la'allakum ta'qilun if there's any feeling that should come to your mind or that should be inside of you if you are an arab the feeling should be it's your responsibility to teach this quran if you're a non-arab you should feel it's respon- it's your responsibility to learn this quran so here we have a mutual feeling of responsibility from both sides and none of these feelings should generate any of this superior superiority inferiority complex so we should read it as normal and as steady as we can in anzalna quranan arabiya la'allakum ta'qilun so that you may discipline your thoughts some people you know they use different words of the quran interchangeably they 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 translate yaqilun like yatafakkarun like yafqahun uh there are there are sometimes subtle sometimes not so subtle differences in the words that are used don't think that some word is used in a particular area and it could be replaced with another synonym so la'allakum ta'qilun so that you may discipline your thoughts and when you when you look at the world today you almost can can detect that a lot of ideas are running wild there's no disciplined thought process allah has revealed to us this extremely important quran so that our thoughts don't run wild so that we can proportion our thoughts together we can tame our intellect in anzalnahu quranan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun nahnu نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن. Notice it's very comfortable to be in the presence of Allah. We are listening to Allah. These are Allah's words. He says, نحن we. Uh, some people may say but you are muslims you believe in one god and in your scripture in your quran your god is saying we so it's not one god this 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 type of uh, accusation or claim comes from people who don't understand the Quran uh, there are phrases in the Quran and there are choices of word that go beyond being the technical or the literary initial or organic meaning that they have so when Allah says nahnu he is saying that out of a matter of esteem out of a matter of status and stature not out of matters a matter of multiplicity he's a multiple god nahnu naqussu so when when you read the quran closely and i hope we all do we will find that when the word nahnu and this is not the only ayah in the quran there are other ayat in the quran which this word nahnu which means we 
is used comes after verbs. Nahnu khalaqnakum. Nahnu narzukukum. We created you. We provided you sustenance. Etc. Nahnu and then a verb. The verb itself requires multiple functions. When Allah says, Nahnu khalaqnakum, the verb khalaqnakum, created you, means that we were created out of dirt, out of a mixture of elements, out of a proportionality of that mixture of elements, out of the placing into effect the correct circumstances, climate, atmosphere, an oxygenated, uh, oxygenated air that we can breathe. There's so many functions involved of this. So these functions need someone to do them. So when you have multiple functions, Allah is in charge of those multiple functions. So he says, Nahnu. Not that he is more than one. It's that the requirements of what is to be done are more than one function. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas. Allah is saying, we narrate to you. Now, uh, here is where the English language is um, almost crippled and cannot deliver the original wording. But we're speaking in English. We're going to have to explain what we mean. Qassa means to trace. To tr with our words, we are tracing what happened. That's what the word means. Exact, the exact words to describe the exact events, how they developed. Nahnu naqussu alayka. We are tracing or trailing recomposing in words what happened in reality for you, O Prophet. Alayka, meaning Allah's Prophet, may Allah's peace be upon him and his. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas. The best of narratives. Many people, you know, think. Qassa, yaqussu, qissa means story. A story is a story. But al qasas has to do with history. And so when Allah is presenting us with these historical facts, the words of Allah are, with the, tra with the translator's license, recreating the actual event. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas in the most perfect way. This is coming to you, this reenactment of events of the past are coming to you in the best possible presentation. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas. بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن. This is done in accordance with our revelation to you of this Quranic scripture. وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين. Even though before this revelation. And before this um, narration of historical events, and of course, this is an introduction to the narration of the 
history of Prophet Yusuf alayhi as-salam. نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص. So what is history? If Allah subhanahu wa taala is taking back, taking us back into history, how can we, in one sense, consider or look at history? History, you can you can look at it both ways. History is um, a chronicle of events that are centered around a Per a particular person, or it is a chronicle of or a detail of persons that are centered around an event. In in Surah Yusuf, the surah that we will be uh, probing more and more, inshallah, to try to get to the bottom of this prejudicial. Right now in our time, it's a racist. The news that you and I are subject to has a lot to do with race. But uh, there will come times when sectarianism is an issue. Uh, to be to be blunt, the the prejudice in us, this asabiya that we will discover hopefully, as we go on. Uh, this asabiya can manifest itself in sectarians. And as much, just like a white person, here I'm, you know, uh, breaking probably into uh, new psychological grounds. A white person living in his or her mentality and in his or her environment really doesn't feel they take race for granted no no one looks at them like they are a race to be pointed at to be to point your finger at oh look you know they grow up not feeling that they are racist they some of them are racist and they, they don't know it And the same thing can be said about those sectarians. Some of them are sectarian and they don't know it. You, you, you can't really uh, gauge your racism or your sectarianism unless you become familiar with the other race or with the other sect you have to become not familiar with them in the sense that oh i'm studying them or something like no no you have to know when you know the other you begin to discover your own self knowing the other is discovering yourself one way of uh, helping us out in this process is today let's get, get to the real world I know this is a little moving out of the exact wordings of the ayat that I just spoke about but it, it will serve like an introduction to the ayat that I'm going to be speaking about uh, some of us consider ourselves Sunnis and others consider themselves Shias and there may be others who consider themselves uh, someone consider them something, whether it's a Sunni or a Shia in that broad context. And then you can break that down. A Sunni can consider himself a Sufi, or he can consider himself a Salafi. And when he takes on the identity of a Sufi or a Salafi, it eclipses his identity as a Sunni, his, his thinking of, of himself as a Sunni now takes a much lesser place. And then him, his thinking of himself as a Salafi or a Sufi takes preponderance, becomes preponderant, becomes overwhelming. 
it it sort of erases the the Sunni definition of it. And the same thing with the Shia. I've been catching it from both sides. But we have to deal with reality. I'm not doing this to antagonize anyone or to be a friend of anyone or to look out for some benefit from anyone or none of that, none of that. We are here in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in his words, in his ayat. So you take a look at a Shi'i. Okay, in the general sense, some person considers himself or herself a Shi'i. But then from there, they get into, okay, what kind of Shi'i here? Is he a 12-er Shi'i, a Ithna Ashari? Is he or she an Ismaili Shi'i, a 7-er Shi'i? Is he or she a Zaydi Shi'i? Et cetera, et cetera. And these identities or these identifications of the self they begin to calcify in the person to such a degree that and we have it now, you know, uh, attitudes because of either definition, either way, you know, whichever way they break down to, they re refuse or they, they don't feel comfortable going to the other's masjid. They all go to Hajj. They'll meet there. Everyone meets in Hajj. But when it comes to the masjid, if a person is a Sunni, whatever breakdown, whatever definition, whatever details there are that follow, but generally speaking, the person is a Sunni, doesn't feel comfortable going to a masjid that is considered a Shia masjid. That is a germination of asabiyyah. It is, it is part of this discriminatory issue that we are living with. Of course, it has blown up in today's world as racism. Who knows? If things continue this way in another 10, 50, 100, whatever, it'll blow up in our part of the world as sectarianism. And likewise, a person who is a Shiite, will not feel comfortable, much less obliged. If we really are living with Allah and accompanying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding his direction and his directives, we would feel the responsibility to go to the other messages to the masjid belonging to, quote, unquote, the other. Isn't that, there's no thing as the other, but we're programmed to think like that. You go to certain uh, educational institutions, and then they begin to uh, teach you what the differences are between a, a, a Shi'i and a Sunni, or vice versa. Instead of us dwelling on what is common, we dwell on what is not common. It's like now we're moving from the sectarian uh, context to the, the racist context. And in, if, you, if you're white, you should feel responsible of going to those who are, I'm using... Uh, you know, I don't want to get on anyone's nerves. I'm just go, flowing with the mainstream language just for the purpose of communication. So I'm using white and black here in the racial context. So if a person is white, he doesn't feel any responsibility, just like, a, let's say, a Sunni Muslim. He doesn't feel any responsibility to go to a Shi'i masjid. And, and likewise, a white person doesn't feel any motivation or responsibility to go to a black, let's say, church or a black school or anywhere there are blacks in congregation. And it goes the other way around too. If you are black or if you are a Shiite, you don't feel a responsibility to go to the others, to break the ice. I mean, 
some people, maybe it's asking too much to do that, but at least to begin to think about doing that so that we can overcome this asabiyya. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas. Let me also bring to your attention here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has about a hundred attributes. Asma'ullahi al-Husna, Allah's beautified names or descriptions. And when we refer to Allah, exalted be he, we refer to him by the exact descriptions that he has given us of him. We can't add another description to him that he has not given us. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is al-Khaliq, we say Allah is al-Khaliq. If he says he is al-Rahman al-Rahim, we say he is al-Rahman al-Rahim. And we continue like that with his al-Asma al-Husna. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he does certain things outside of the, the attributes and descriptions that he gave us of himself. Like he says he is al-Khaliq, so what he does, yakhluq, he creates. He says he is merciful so what he does he expresses mercy etc etc so out of his attributes we can we can say the verbs that come out of those nouns but on the other hand when we read Allah's words meaningful words we find that he attributes to himself some verbs that are not part of his attributes. Just like in this ayah, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We narrate to you, O Prophet, the best of chronicles, the best of narrated events. So we can't say Allah is a qas in the Arabic language, the person who is narrating, meaning the narrator, the word for that is qas. So even though Allah used the verb naqussu, we can use the verb because he used it, but we cannot out of that, we can't go in the opposite direction. When Allah gave us his description in nouns, we can, out of those nouns, extract verbs relating to Allah. Al-Mudhil, Yudhil. Al-Mu'iz, Yu'iz. Al-Khafid, Yakhfid. Al-Rafi', Yarfa. Al-Majid, etc., etc. But when it comes to Allah using verbs, actions, related to him, we cannot attribute a descriptive noun out of that action to him. Um, وما, another ayah, I'm just giving examples here. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى in the con this has to do with uh, this ayah it was revealed and it has to do with um, warfare at times of war military engagement Allah is saying it is not you O prophet who in today's English pulled the trigger it was not you who aimed the bow and arrow and released the arrow وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It was Allah who was doing that. So رَمَى is a verb, but we can't say Allah رَمِي. We can't go from verb to noun. 
We can go from noun to verb, but we can't go in the opposite direction. Here is where Allah is inviting us to think. And here is where some people, because they prioritize their thoughts and try to break away from Allah's text, here's where they go wrong. And those who stick to Allah's text didn't have enough intellectual, let's say, power to begin to make a distinction here and be careful with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wording this information to us. Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al-qasas bima awhayna ilayka hadha al-Qur'an wa in kunta min qablihi lamin al-ghafili. We will go on in Surah Yusuf to explore the, this is in the company of Allah, Jalla Shatna. We're not doing this on our own, meaning we are not trying to improvise things here. We All, all we are trying to do is work our, the mind that Allah has given us with the words that he has given us. There are two givens from Allah. The meanings that come from him and the exploration of those meanings that come from him. His ayat and our minds. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Even though before this time you were unaware of the information that is coming your way. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to Muhammad alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam. Now, that it felt very comfortable being in the company of Allah and rethinking ourselves through just these two or three ayat at the beginning of Surah Yusuf. But in the coming ayat, we will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Yusuf in his family. He speaks about Yusuf in a foreign land. He speaks about Yusuf behind bars. And he speaks about Yusuf being in the in the household of the upper class of society in Egypt. And he speaks about Yusuf when he becomes a minister, in today's language, a government official, a minister, in the establishment of Egypt at that time. Notice that these ayat, for those people, I know there's plenty of people out there, not you who are listening, but the general public, plenty of people out there who, when it comes to, oh, how come Allah is speaking about a king? How come he's speaking about a person of influence and affluence? So what Allah is less than to speak about these types? If they are right, he says they are right. If they are wrong, he says they are wrong. If they are kind, he describes them as they are. If they are tyrannical, he gives us the necessary information to deal with them. They are not beyond our reach. This type of crippled psychology that we have, generally speaking, has brought us to where we are today. When someone today wants to speak about the land of the Qur'an, Arabia. I say, ah, oh, what are you doing? There's thousands of people right now behind bars. We're not supposed to put our God-given mind on this issue, deal with it. There's some tyranny. There's some oppression. There's some injustice that is at work. We're supposed to look the other way as if we're not responsible human beings. When there's thousands behind bars now in Arabia, 
There are thousands now in Arabia who are not permitted to travel. They're not behind bars. They're not incarcerated in a prison. They're incarcerated in a country. And we're not supposed to be able to speak about this. There are decision makers in Arabia. We w I wouldn't be speaking about Arabia if it wasn't for Mecca and Al Medina. It would be just like some other country, tin pot dictators ruling all over the place. But we should be sensitized to the fact that these tin pot dictators have control of Mecca and Al Medina. This should concern every Muslim in the world who is reading this Quran and who is in the company of the majesty of Allah, Jallat Hikmatu. This is our responsibility. You should be speaking about this. Military bases being built in Al Ard Al Haram, military impositions, establishments, systems, hierarchies, forces that have stifled, suffocated, choked off Mecca and Al Medina from the rest of the Muslims in the world. And that was done because of this systemized asabiya that has fractured the Muslims, two billion plus Muslims in the world have been fractured into 57 main asabiyas called nation states in the world. This is the culmination of asabiya. Who says? I can't go to Mecca and Al Medina because I am, and then here we have the Asabiyat, because I'm not Saudi Arabia, because I don't belong to a certain, or because I belong to a certain school of thought, or because I express myself freely, my Islamic conscience and mind freely, or these other excuses that they have for barring Muslims all over the world, because of their asabiyya, it's, asab it's a linkage of an internal asabiyya, the sectarian and the nationalist, with the class and the race in the world. All of these interlocked, all of these asabiyyat. And asabiyya is simply the collective ego, the pluralist collective ego that has placed these barriers between us and the Prophet of Allah, between us and the land of the Prophet of Allah, between us and the book of the Prophet of Allah, between us and the history of the Prophet of Allah. There are many obstacles, and our number one enemy here is our ignorance. Don't tell... Don't let anyone have you believe anything else. We have many enemies, no doubt. But our number one enemy is our own ignorance. And we have to defeat this enemy, this ignorance of ours. And hopefully at this time, every week, if I can begin it on time next week, inshallah, I'll try my best. We will contribute to defeating this enemy of ignorance that made it possible for these wars of aggression and this imperialist colonization of our lands. This was all done because they colonized our minds. We have to get rid of this. And the only surefire way of get, getting rid of this is to be in the presence of Allah. This book of his is his trust to us. And hopefully at this time every week, we will hold our hands together, metaphorically. We will bring our minds together with Allah's assistance. And we will subdue this ignorance and eliminate it from among us. Allahumma ja'alna min al yastami'oon al-qawl. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةَ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته
peace.